Coming from an athletic family, it is no surprise Doug Gibson developed into a very good hockey player. He came up through Church League and Junior B ranks to play three Junior A seasons with the Peets, breaking Mickey Redmond's goal scoring mark and competing in the 1972 Memorial Cup Final in Ottawa. As a pro, Doug was an outstanding playmaking center with, Rochester, with the Rochester Americans of the American Hockey League and was named to their Hall of Fame. He was twice winner of the AHL's MVP award and was also named twice to the first All-Star team. In 1974-75, he earned the league scoring title and was the Hockey News Minor League Player of the Year. Doug played for two NHL teams, Boston and Washington, collecting nine goals and 19 assists in 63 games. He later became coach of the Hershey Bears and was the 1979-80 Coach of the Year. Doug played four seasons for Garmisch. You know what? I'll get your pronunciation on the German team. Parton Kirchen. Okay, there we go. 1980-81 European champions. At home, Doug broke into a city softball league, into the city of the softball league at 13, and matured into a starry pitcher, honored as the city's best in 1978. Doug Gibson. Thank you very much for joining me, and thank you for uh, the pronunciation on the German team. You spent two seasons there at the end of your career. Um, you know, I'll ask you quickly, what was the transition like from American hockey to European hockey uh, back then? It was back then not too many people knew about European hockey. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and at the time, after we won the Calder Cup in 1980, uh, I, my contract was up, I needed a job, and we got this offer to go to, uh, over to Germany. We were debating and uh, all of a sudden they made it a three-year deal and my wife and I decided, why don't we go? Yeah. And, but the hockey was very good, better than I expected. Mm -hmm. um, almost like a college game where they, we played games on Friday night and Sunday and one home, one away. And it was just a lot of adrenaline, and, and uh, but it was an exciting time for us over there. Yeah, and so that's the end of your professional career. And let's go back to the start. And but before we do that, I just want to get your impressions on your bio, uh, your Hall of Fame bio. You were inducted in 1992. And do you remember the last time that you would have read that or heard that? Um, probably <laughs> back in 1992. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I thought they covered it very well. Mm -hmm. Um, it, was, it was an exciting time because at the time my dad was in the, the Hall of Fame and yeah. we became one of the first uh, father-son duos to be in. And, and then later, of course, when my mom was inducted into the Hall of Fame for her work in church league softball and that sort of thing as a builder, um, it, was, it was very exciting. So we're, we're very proud to be members of the Peterborough District Sports Hall of Fame. And uh, on the topic of your parents, I'm guessing, you can only guess that's where everything started uh, for you in sports. So let's go back to the beginning. That's right. Uh, my dad at that time, I, I don't ever remember watching him play. Um, he was more in the management part of it. Mm -hmm. uh, he was involved in City League Softball, the Church Hockey League. Uh, he was in bar involved with the, the Pepsi Peach, which are now the, now the Lakers in lacrosse. Uh, and and he, he was an, a master organizer. Um, and so he encouraged us all to play sports. And of course, mom was, was a very good athlete growing up. She played all the sports, basketball, uh, softball, swimming. The, she covered the whole gamut. And she encouraged us to, to do the same. And the, the interesting part about her is I can remember she was our catcher because my brother Rob, my brother Larry and I were all pitchers for Mark Street in, okay. the, in the church softball league. And she'd, she'd be warming us up out in the laneway. And I, I remember finally the one day one of us threw one and it just missed her. And she said, that's it boys, your dad has to catch her from now on. <laughs> <laughs> so you played uh, the, the notable sports for you are fast pitch and hockey, but uh, you talk about your mom playing every sport, your dad organizing every sport. So what were your round out sports that you really enjoyed to play in, in town? Well, I mean, I played softball growing up all the yeah. way. We also played baseball, hardball mm -hmm. back in the day we called it. Yeah. Um, and I, w I would play for the East City teams. That, that's where we initially grew up. Um, and in, in high school, I got to play a little bit of field lacrosse, and I played some football up at Adam Scott. We were the Casa champs one year. Um, and other sports, I, I enjoyed playing every sport. Mm -hmm. You know, we, 
We dabbled a little bit in tennis at the old Bonnerworth Park uh, and that sort of thing. But, uh, you, you know, we played every sport that, that was available, but mm -hmm. it was mostly hockey and softball that, that I played. So the, uh, the line of lacrosse and baseball from East City to, I guess, the rest of the city kind of holds true. Well, believe it or not, growing up, mm -hmm. lacrosse was a South End sport. Yep. Yeah. Because the old Civic Arena is where they, they had the sport, and that's where they had the summer lacrosse school. Mm -hmm. um, and when my dad got involved uh, in lacrosse with the Pepsi Peets, now the Lakers, um, I was Bantam age. And, uh, but my two younger brothers, Rob and Larry, again, they played lacrosse because the, the lacrosse house league in the summer uh, didn't have a bantam house league. Okay. It was only the, the, the all-star teams that, that played bantam and midget. And so I, I never played. Uh, but back in the day, as I say, it was a south end sport because very few families had two vehicles. Oh, yes. So when, when dad went to work in the morning, you had no way to get down to the rink unless you walked or rode your bike. Okay. So it, it really was a South End sport. All the guys that grew up, you know, uh, the Evans family, John Grant uh -huh. Sr., all those guys, they were South End guys and they were the, they were the lacrosse players in town. Well, yeah, I, I keep hearing that from people. It's fascinating, honestly. You can draw a line through the city, and these are the baseball players, and these are the lacrosse players. That's exactly it. Uh, it's, it's really interesting as we keep hearing more about it. But uh, you had your two brothers, and you're the oldest? I'm the oldest, okay, yes. Okay, so you must have had some adventures, I guess, going to the ball diamond uh, cool. with the two of them. Well, we, we really did. And um, we, we would go, if, if you weren't playing, you had to go watch them play, mm -hmm. you know, sort of thing. And and growing up at home, when we moved to the North End, we had a park right across the road. And if mom and dad needed to find us, we were over there playing ball, hockey, playing whatever was, was going on. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, that, that was just growing up back in the day. Yeah. And we, we were active all the time and uh, always on the go. Now how much do you think uh, just playing the sports or going out and, and it's your it's not so much your vocation, it's just something you're out there doing. Um, how much do you think that contributes to a lifelong, I guess, relationship with the games and your continued involvement with the games, but growing up with your brothers and always being out, how much do you believe that contributes to where you are now? Oh, that, that, that was the bottom line. I mean, we were all competitive and we would all go over. There were two years between each of us and if we needed an extra player, we'd call my sister Susan or my younger sister Donna, and they would come over and play. You know, we, yeah. we, had, we had a real good group of, of guys playing, John Ackford, Steve Wilson, all those guys in the park, Daryl and Bill Craig. You know, we, we were all out there playing, and it didn't matter what time of year, mm -hmm. but there was a sport to be played. Yeah. And uh, you talk about, again, going through the years, the seasons, your dad was organizing and your mom was there to help, obviously, uh, but uh, coaches that you encountered along the way that would have helped you, and I'm assuming that they would have gone from sport to sport oftentimes with you guys? Yes, they did. Uh, I mentioned earlier we play, I played for Mark Street Church mm -hmm. in the old Peterborough Community Church Hockey League and Peterborough Community Church Softball League. So we would go sport to sport and we had the same coaches Don Dorsett was our coach in Tadpole. Uh, that's what it was called back then. It's now called Ad Adam. Okay. Or now, it, now it would be under nine, yes, under ten. Yes, all changing. Yeah. But we started when we were five years old, and we, we you know, we played. Uh, and then uh, Ray Stewart was our coach in uh, in Pee Wee. Um, my dad was the coach in Bantam, mm -hmm. and Russ Scriver would be the coach in Midget. So we had those coaches all the way up in both hockey in the winter and softball in the spring. Hmm. So that, that's where we all learned the basics of the game. And those, those gentlemen were, were all very dedicated and they knew the sports. So they, they taught us how to play. The, the guys that you were playing with, did you all, I'm assuming you all came up being friends, but then you have the same mentors and leaders and how much did that shape you? A lot. Um, those guys, Jack Scriver, Gar Payne, Doug McFadden, Rick Toms. We all grew up in East City together. We all went to Mark Street Church. Mm -hmm. Every Sunday morning we'd be there. We played hockey, you know, for the church in the winter, softball for the church in the spring. And that, that was our life, you know. We, we all played 
and we all learned the game together. And those guys that I just mentioned, I still see them today, and we all play, well, we, we play more golf today than we, yeah. we do ball and, and hockey, but, but we're all still friends today, and uh, it's just always great to get back together with them. Absolutely, and are, do they play with you still in men's slow pitch still? Uh, well? No, they're, they're okay. not playing. I just started to play slow pitch last year. Okay. And uh, I'm, I'm meeting a whole bunch of guys. I, I know a lot of people in town and a lot of the guys are, are playing. But uh, the, the guys that I grew up with, um, I mean, I basically lost touch for a few years when I went away to play. Yeah. Uh, but then when I came back, we, we hooked up again and, and it was, it's been good. So we'll get up to that then. Um, when you came up through the church leagues, you're with your friends, and then you get to play with the, the Peterborough Peets. Like, exactly. you, didn't, you didn't have to leave your friends. And uh, now you, you're hearing parents of junior athletes or junior hockey players saying, well, I want them to go away or I want them to stay home. You never know what you're going to get. But uh, how much did it mean to you to get to stay home? Well, back then, growing up in Peterborough, your dream was to play for the Peterborough Peets. Mm -hmm. um, I was one of the lucky ones that was able to, to make the Peets, you know, growing up. But, I mean, we grew up, we all went to the Peets games. Um, we, we would, uh, you know, idolize those players. I mean, Andre Lacroix, Mickey Redman, you know, uh, Wayne Conley. They, they were the guys that I can remember growing up. And, you know, of course, you're out playing road hockey and that's who you wanted to be. Yeah. Uh, but then, you know, when I was able to make it, it was, it was a lifelong dream come true. When you broke Mickey Redmond's record, was that, like, when you see, just to pull a reference, when Gretzky broke Gordie Howe's record, it, it was an emotional moment for him, was it? What yes. was it like for you? Yes, it was, it was. Uh, the year before, I had tied Mickey's record, mm -hmm. uh, and then my final year junior, uh, I was able to, to break the record, and, you know, I, I can remember the game now. Uh, it was against Hamilton, and I scored the goal. It was on Roly Kimball, who used to play for the Peets. We traded him to Hamilton, but I scored the goal. And I can remember going back to center and waiting, and Roger Nielsen was our coach, and Roger just had a knack for things like this. He waited uh, just before the puck was going to be dropped, and then he changed lines. So I mm -hmm. got a little bit more. Um, you got to bask uh, in a little bit. Uh, yeah, exactly, exactly. It, it, it was a real nice time. Hey, last night, uh, Jason Williams potentially, or Justin Williams potentially, his last NHL game with 37 seconds left. Rod Brendamore puts him out onto the ice. So that's, so I, Th that's exactly yes. what I'm talking about, that so, sort of thing. Okay, so the good guy moments from a coach. So something that, uh, yes. a real, a, a unique thing. You don't see in everybody, but that's nice to hear. No, you don't. And it was something I, I really appreciated. And the, the names that you got to encounter, or that you did encounter, um, who sticks out to you the most? I, I know you had, you've had notable coaches, Roger Nielsen and, and Don Cherry, we talked about a little bit, like those are names that everybody knows in, in Canada and North America even in hockey, but uh, who really meant the most to you? Uh, from a, let's say from junior on. Well, you know, it, it's interesting. I mentioned all my minor hockey coaches. Um, one other guy I should mention was Roy Armstrong. He coached us back then when we played in the church league. Mm -hmm. You had to try out for the all-star team. And we had uh, Roy Armstrong as our coach for two years in Pee Wee and then two years again in Bantam. Uh, you know, and then uh, we had Red Wasson, who's another member of our Sports Hall of Fame, as our coach in Midget, he and Eddie Rowe. And that was a real growing experience for me going up. And mm -hmm. And Red, Red coached us like young men, um, you know, so that really helped. And, and then I moved on to Junior B, and I had Pat Baker, who's in the Hall of Fame. He's renowned as a lacrosse goaltender. Mm -hmm. And uh, I learned a lot from Pat, you know, and in the meantime, Gary Darling, who was a scout uh, for Boston, for Montreal, for Philadelphia, uh, involved in the NHL for years. Gary was, was also... I can remember when I was younger, I, my dad was the manager of the Junior B team, Gary Darling was the coach, and I would get to go practice with the Junior Bs. And, you know, I can remember Gary yelling at me as if I was one of his regular players, telling me, keep your stick on the ice, yeah. just little tips like that, that, that I, I yell now at the kids when I'm coaching. <laughs> so, it, you know, 
I've had a lot of them, but then after Junior B, of course, I had Roger Nielsen for yeah. three years, and, and Roger taught us a lot, you know. Um, and then I moved on, and uh, my first year uh, in the NHL, we had Bep Gwidlin as a coach, and one of the things about Bep, who just passed away a couple of years ago, he was the youngest player ever to play in the NHL at 16 years old, which it can't happen nowadays, yeah. you know, but but he was, and, and he was a good coach, and, and that year I was called up from the American League for the last week of the season and then the, the playoffs, and we, you know, that's the year we lost out to Philadelphia in the finals, but Bep was the coach then, and then of course Don Cherry came in, mm -hmm. you know, and, and Don, everybody knows Don, he's yep. a household name in Canada, yep. um, but what you see is what you get from Don Cherry, mm -hmm. you know, he was a master motivator, not so much for X's nose, but he motivated you to go out and play hard. Yeah. And you know, that, that, was, that was the thing. And then when I got into coaching, one of my big things is, you know, we have to play hard. We have to compete every time we're on the ice. So, you know, you, you pick up a little something from every coach along the way, and hopefully you can use it to your advantage, you know, when you get the opportunity to coach. The shape who you end up becoming, I guess. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. All right. And when you were in Peterborough with, with the Peets, you had uh, an amazing time. It was an amazing three years. You were the MVP of the team twice. Uh, you went to the Memorial Cup in 1972 in Ottawa, and you lost 2-1 in the finals. Like, yeah. And the, the goalie, I guess, a Brodeur of a different, a different Brodeur, yes. still a long NHL career, but yep. uh, not Marty Brodeur, Richard Brodeur, Richard I believe. Brodeur, yeah. um, so he kind of stymied you guys, and you won your first two games in the round robin, then to lose to Cornwall. The, how does that still resonate with you really oh. because it's such a close game oh yes yes I mean that whole scenario that was the first year um, major junior hockey I don't even think it was called major junior back then but went to this round robin format yeah. so you know you played each team once we we beat uh, oh boy we beat Cornwall I think 4-2 mm -hmm. then we beat Edmonton 6-2 yeah. You know, so that qualified us to get to the finals. And, you know, we came and, and Cornwall beat us two to one. One of the goals, a slap shot from the point went off the glass, came back over the net and hit Mike Beiser in the back and went into our net. So it, it was it was one of those ones and left a sour taste in our mouth because, mm -hmm. you know, we thought we were the better team. Well, it might have been. It happens often. It, it, it certainly does. It certainly does. But it was definitely an exciting time, you know, to play for the Peterborough Peets. And Cornwall, uh, they're so close to Ottawa, I guess. Did they have almost a home, a home, a home rink advantage? Well, the interesting part, and I don't know how many people know this, but for the, for the final game, um, they flipped a coin to see who was home team. Okay. And Cornwall won the flip. And... Uh, just forget the name of their coach right now, but he coached for years as well. He says, that's okay, we'll be the visiting team. And I can remember Roger Nielsen was so happy with that because that gave us the last change. Yeah. And Roger was known to try to match lines and, and that sort of thing. So it, it was just those little things stick out in my mind, mm -hmm. you know, but we weren't able to take advantage of it. And, uh, you know, they won. Do you still remember what Roger Nielsen had to say to you guys after the game? Uh, not really, not really, mm -hmm. but R Roger was never, um, he would always use something like that to motivate us, mm -hmm. you know, um, and, and I can remember, um, you know, Roger was one of the first guys to bring in video, and one day we were having a, a team meeting back when you just didn't have, you know, team meetings, and he started this old black and white video showing a picture of us when we won the, what is now the, well, it was the OHA championship. Yeah. We beat out Ottawa in five games. And it just showed us, you know, getting the trophy and skating around the ice. And, and that was the motivation for the next year, mm -hmm. you know, to, to go on. So he, he didn't say too much, much negative, yeah. you know, about our loss to Cornwall. You know, just that we gave it our best shot and came up one goal short. Was... He seems, uh, he's certainly ahead of his time with video, but in terms of the way that he did coach, was he more the way modern coaches have to be now in terms of the carrot versus the stick, I guess? I, 
I, I'm not sure how, how he was behind the bench. Yeah, I'm, I'm Roger when, well, an interesting example, as I mentioned earlier, Roger liked to match lines. Yeah. And my first game ever playing for the Peets, I was a center, had played center all my life, and you know made, made the Peets as a center my first year. And so I, I go into the rink for our first game. We're playing St. Catharines Blackhawks back then. And they had a guy named Marcel Dion playing for them. And we had Craig Ramsey on our team. And so our line was supposed to be Craig on left wing, me at center, and Danny Gluer on right. And we go in and Rogers got the lines up on the blackboard. And here I am playing left wing. Mm -hmm. Because Craig Ramsey always shadowed Marcel Dion yeah. whenever we played them and so there I am and I went over to Craig and I said Craig what's going on is Roger got this mixed up he said no no I have to cover Marcel Dion tonight <laughs> so I had to go out my first game junior and had to play left wing which was a first <laughs> was it well let's say the wings are more a little bit more simple than I guess center but uh, Marcel Dion being on the ice he didn't have a, a legend about him then, I guess. He wasn't an NHL Hall of Famer at that point. But uh, again, that's something else that you got to experience that would have been uh, wild for your first game. You're out there with Marcel Dion. Oh, exactly, exactly. Play, you know, the St. Catharines Blackhawks. They had a lot of good players yeah. back then, and you know, but Marcel was one of the best players in the league, and it, it was just an interesting way for me to start my my junior yes. career. I got to skate with Marcel Dion in a, in a Easter Seals tournament a couple of years ago. I guess he's different now. Yeah. <laughs> he's <just> <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I can't imagine him being in the shape he was no, in back then. No, he's a little different, I'd <laughs> imagine. Uh, but uh, then uh, go through to your pro career, and you're drafted pretty high, and you get a chance pretty early. And again, you, you get a chance to play in a in a situation that not every player gets to go into. I guess almost like Nick Robertson got thrown right into the playoffs this year for the Peter, or Peterborough Peets with the Toronto Maple Leafs. Um, you had a similar situation and uh, you get a chance to play and then you get a shot a year after and then it kind of tapered off for you. Uh, how did that sit with you because you were producing at the AHL, you're producing at the OHL, um, but yeah. do you feel like you got your shot in the NHL? Uh, no, I don't. It, it, uh Probably sounds like sour grapes, but um, growing up, I was always a leading scorer on our team. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it went right through with the Peets and then to the American League. I was fortunate enough to play with some very good players. Um, won a scoring championship, was always in the top scorers. Um, but it, it was difficult to break into the NHL because in Boston, we had Phil Esposito ahead of me at center, Derek Sanderson ahead of me. I mean, it, it was one of those things, it, it might have been easier for me to break into the team if I was more of a third, fourth line grinder. Yeah. You know, but, but back then, the, the fourth line didn't get on the ice very much. You know, they went with, with three lines. In fact, I can remember one game, Phil Esposito, um, I was watching the game and Phil went through three sets of wingers in one shift. You know, so you didn't get the ice time it's, it's not split up now. They make a lot of uh, noise about ice time yeah. now in the NHL. You see them giving everyone's ice time when you're watching the games on TV. Um, back then, you know, if you played on the fourth line, you might get on the ice two or three times a game. You wow. know, and that, that's just the way it worked. But, you know, I, I, I've always felt that if I had been given more of a chance, I could have played a lot longer in the National Hockey League. Did they try and turn you into a different type of player? No, no, no. no. When, when, when I finally did get my opportunity, um, I went up, uh, when I was called up to Boston, it was at the time of the Phil Esposito trade to the New York Rangers, and Jean Rattel would not report to the Bruins right away. So they called me up because they needed a center to play on the top two lines. Mm -hmm. So I went up and scored a goal my first two games, you know, and then all of a sudden, when Jean Rattel reported, I went down to become the fourth line player and didn't get to play a whole lot. Yeah. You know, when I did play, I was able to produce somewhat, you know, but I just didn't get the chance to, to prove myself. And then you, you, you did prove yourself. You proved yourself by winning uh, the American Hockey League MVP, um, scoring titles. Um, how does that feel? Does it feel 
do you have like a, a personal asterisk with that? Like it's it's an amazing accomplishment, and but uh, and you're the hockey news is uh, minor league hockey player of the year, and you get all these accolades, and do you, again, I know you said you, you don't feel like you got your shot. It doesn't seem like you got your shot if you look at that. But uh, when you look back at those things, uh, how does it make you feel? It makes me feel real good. Yeah, you know. Um, the American Hockey League was was the second best league mm -hmm. in the world back then, and you know we were able to play, and my line mates and I we had a lot of success, um, and normally that will lead you to the next level, you know, on a more regular basis. Yeah. But I mean, I I did get my shot at mm -hmm. the NHL. I played the full year. But then I tore up my knee, mm -hmm. and I was just never able to get back on a regular basis. The sometimes it actually stuns me when you look at the production, like a guy like Bruce Boudreau, like he absolutely tore up the AHL. Yep. But uh, you never saw him get into the NHL at any point, really. Um, with the how stiff was the competition in the AHL at that time compared to what it would be now? I know it's still a great competitive league, but with how many teams there are in the NHL versus then, what was the difference in the AHL style back then? Uh, the AHL style was, was a very good league. They, um, one of the years I played, I think we only had six teams in the league. Wow. So more than one NHL team would send players to a minor league team. And it was, it was a very competitive league. A lot of older veterans who would be finishing up their career, mm -hmm. you know, played, but I mean, they were our mentors, you know, and we would, would help the coaching staff along. Um, but, but it was a very good league, you know, um, and, and it's like everything else. I mean, I can remember playing, we were playing in Springfield one night and Charlie Simmer had been sent down and he was playing in Springfield. Two weeks later, he got called up and he played on the Triple Crown line in Los Angeles with uh, Marcel Dion. Yeah. And uh, oh, what, I, don't, I forget the other, I mm -hmm. forget the right winger's name who became a coach. But um, that was that was the way it was. Uh, normally, if you had a hot streak in the American League, you would get called up. Yeah. But uh, that just didn't work for me. Now there are movies about minor league hockey. Uh, Slapshot, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, how much of that uh, holds true to what you experienced? in terms of sometimes going to uh, hostile arenas or things of that nature, how much of that did you see? A lot. Yeah. Um, the, the movie Slapshot is very true, but it was in the old International League. Yeah. yeah. Okay. The American League was a little more refined <laughs> than that league. But back then, and, and people nowadays don't believe us when we tell them about the bench emptying brawls that we used to have. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's just the way it was. There, there was, when we first started, there was no third man in rule. In fact, I can remember my first year with the Peets, John Garrett was our goaltender. And John stood up in the dressing room before the first game. He said, guys, don't worry. If you're in a fight, I'll be there. <laughs> and he would be the third man in every time. <laughs> and that, you know, that way you, did, you, know, you yeah. didn't have to worry about having to fight the big tough guy on the other team because John would be How tall is John there. Garrett? Sorry? How tall is John Garrett though? John Garrett's not very tall, yes, but he yeah. had all the goalie <laughs> equipment on, so he was well protected. Yeah. Well, actually that's something else. Uh, Richard Brodeur, he's five foot seven, John Garrett pretty much the same height, I yeah. guess. Goalies. Yeah. Exactly. Different species now. Well, that's the one thing that has probably improved the most in hockey mm -hmm. is goaltending. Yeah. They're well coached now. I mean, back when we played <laughs> You know, your coach would say to the goalie, just stand in that, stand on your feet and keep your stick on the ice. I mean, that was the coaching that a lot of them got. Yeah. Now it's very specific coaching for them. Every team has a goaltending coach, yeah. you know, which, which is, has improved that part of the sport immensely. How much did you see during your playing career in terms of the evolution of hockey? Um, well, quite a bit. They, they were... Um, they started to refine it. They put in the third man rule for fighting because uh -huh. um, it was a real rough and tumble sport, you know, back, I, I would say, in the 60s and 70s. Uh -huh. um, and then they started to refine that more. And as, as everything improved, equipment, skates, sticks, everybody, I mean, nowadays, the guys all can skate. They can all the fire the puck like a rocket, you yep. know, with the sticks they have now. Um, 
So the, the game is, is, has really changed skill-wise. Yeah, and I'm going to go back to the names that you played with or were coached by. Um, for instance, I have Derek Sanderson's book at my desk, uh, I've read Don Cherry's books. Um, do you ever find yourself, have you read those? Do you look back at those? And, and how does that make you, I guess, recollect on those times? Well, you mentioned Derek Sanderson's book, and of course I've read Phil Esposito's book and mm -hmm. Bobby Orr's. That was my era. They were guys I played with. Yeah. And, and you can believe all those stories. Yeah. I mean, I, I was there for all of those stories. I mean, it, it, it was neat. It, it, <laughs> you know, they, they are guys who um, set the stage in the NHL. I mean, mm -hmm. the big bad Bruins, you know, of the early 70s, that they were, they were major parts of that team. And uh, when you got to the end of your playing career, uh, we talked about this a little bit, but uh, you went to Germany, and he said it was a competitive league, more competitive than you thought it was going to be. But uh, at that time, you have, you have two daughters, correct? Yes, Courtney and Kylie. Were they with you at that point in time? Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. And, and I can remember when we agreed to go to, to Germany to play, all of a sudden, we had to be there. I had to be on the ice July 15th. So we're, I think we flew out on July 12th, if I remember correctly, and because you fly overnight, so you uh -huh. get there the next day. And, and so I can remember being at the airport, my parents and my wife Holly's parents were there to see us off, and we're going through security, and Holly turns to me and says, I have no idea where <laughs> we're going, but at least we're all going together, and we went through security with the two girls. <laughs> she planned that line? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that's just the line she came out with. It's like a movie. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, how old were your daughters at that point in time? They were uh, one and four. Okay, so did they, how much of, I guess, did you, did you live there in the off season as well? No, we would come home every year. Our, our, my contract stated I had to be there from July 15th to March 15th. Okay. So as soon as our season was over, we would have, they called them friendship games, exhibition games. Mm -hmm. That's how the team would make some extra money. We would go and play lower division teams around yeah. Germany. And, uh, but then come March 15th, we'd have our flights booked and we'd be able to fly home and you know, visit everybody. What, what did that, uh, how much did that shape your daughters, I guess, spending a few years in Germany? A lot. Um, we, we were there for four years mm -hmm. and the girls were completely fluent in German when they came home. Um, in fact, uh, there was an American Army base in Garmisch, and so we would go down there and we took the kids to the American Montessori School, mm -hmm. and then they would go there in the morning, and then in the afternoon we would, or no, we would take them to the German school in the morning, and then to the American Montessori in the afternoon. Okay. And um, as I say, they were completely fluent in German, um, and as it turned out, my daughter Courtney married a goaltender, Mark MacArthur, who lives here in town, and they ended up playing over in Europe for 12 years. Um, I think six of those years they played in Garmisch so as well. He had a tour guide. Yes, okay. so they went over and you know the kids just stepped right into German school. My grandchildren, mm -hmm. Taylor and, and Skyler, were able to step right into German school. And so, I mean, it, it worked out very well because Courtney was very comfortable going back to, to mm -hmm. Garmisch. Um, Rob Wilson, head coach of the Peterborough Peets right now, uh, he coached in Germany. Uh, yes. Andrew Werner played in Austria. Uh, they both speak German, I know that. Oh, uh, yes. But how much it, the Canadian hockey influence in Germany, actually a, a, a guy I grew up playing hockey with plays over there as well right now. He's been there for like 12 years and I don't know if he's ever going to come back, but uh, mm -hmm. they go over there. How much is the hockey influenced by, I guess, the Canadians that are over there? Well, it, it's influenced a lot. Um, I know back when we were there, some teams were very heavily influenced by Canadian hockey. Mm -hmm. Some were heavily influenced by Russian or now what is now Czech Republic hockey because those coaches would come in, those players would come in hmm. and play. Um, but it, it's, it, it's a place I recommend to a lot of players who when they come out, they play their first pro contract, and if they haven't received a chance to go play, I recommend to them to go play in Europe. Hmm. I mean, you get a chance to see the world, and the hockey is very good over there now. So it, it's, it's a great life experience. Or the fans like? 
The fans are very rabid, just like the soccer fans over in Europe. I mean, that's the way it was. We, we, I'm dating myself here again, but when we would go into a place like Mannheim or Fusen, they're outdoor rinks. They might have a roof, yeah. but I can remember playing in blizzards and they'd have to stop the game halfway through to, to Zamboni the ice yeah. and clear the snow. Um, but it, it was just, and you would, you would get to the games and the fans would be in the stands before warm-up with the sparklers going and singing and, and carrying it's, on. I mean, yeah. it, it, was, it was actually a very good atmosphere to play in. That's what I love about watching the World Championships each year. The arenas are like giant cathedrals. The, the, did you play in those ones with the big wooden roofs? Oh, yes. Yeah. yes that, that's the way they were all yeah. built back then. Yes. You know, and they would have the big wooden roof, but the sides would be open, and that's where the snow and everything would blow in <laughs> in the winter. <laughs> Did you pick up German pretty well? I, I p picked up quite a bit. Yeah. I mean, they, the guys used to tease me. I spoke Gibbs Deutsch. All right. And it was very heavily accented. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, but no, um, both Holly and I were able to pick up enough German to, to get by, and, and we really enjoyed our time over there. And then once you're done playing pro hockey, what, well, first of all, before we get any further, what brought you that decision? What was it that said, all oh, right, that's, that's the end of the line for this? Yeah, it, it, was, it was one of those, it was just getting more difficult to get into game shape, yeah. you know, and play at the level that I expected to be able to play at. And, uh, you know, I, I had torn up my knee a couple of times, and it, it was just one of those things that one day I came home and I, I just said, it, it's time. Yeah. I think this will be my last year. So did you make that decision before or after the season was completed? Before. Okay, so then how did that change the way you approached the season at that point? I'm sure you still were out there competing, but did you, were you reflecting that entire season? No, no. It, I think it gave me uh, more ambition because mm -hmm. um, I wanted to finish on a winning note. Um, my, my first year over in, in Garmisch, uh, we only lost six games all year. We won the German Bundesliga, uh, and you know we. But unfortunately, the way they do it in Garmisch, it's it's in the the Alps, mm -hmm. and that's where the, all the hockey players used to come from in Germany. So after each season, we would sell a couple of our better players to the northern teams, Dusseldorf, Cologne, mm -hmm. and that's how they made money to keep the team going. Yeah, you know so. Our, our team was continually a young team, you know, coming up through and, and developing players. And uh, the first year we had, we had a real strong team and we were able to win the German championship. Um, and then each year we weren't quite as good and our final year we ended up losing to Mannheim in the playoffs, but uh, it, was, it was a real good run. Were you surprised when you saw Leon Dreisaitl show up in the NHL? No, no, no because the that the Germans are developing players. In fact, when I played over there, we had a couple of players on our team, Franz Reindl, who is now the head of the German Ice Hockey Federation, and Ernst Hofner. Um, they were very good players, and I'm sure they could have played in the American League and maybe developed to yeah. go play in the NHL. In fact, you know, we, we, we called Alan Eagleson from Germany one year in an effort to try to get these guys a tryout, but it never worked out for us, unfortunately. To try, well, Alan Eagleson was, so he was an agent, and then he was with the league, correct? No, he, he, or he, he was everything. He, okay, yeah. You know, as, as he told us one year, when I go into a meeting, I just change my hat. <laughs> you know, I mean, so he, he represented players, he represented coaches, mm -hmm. he represented trainers, you know. He, he was involved with a lot in the NHL back then. Some of it not so good as we've learned, yes, yeah. you know, recently. But uh, back then, he was the big name in hockey. If you wanted to get something going. Now you transitioned from playing to, I guess, a, 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 you, tr you tried out a, a normal job, mm -hmm. a non-hockey job, and that didn't last long. And then you're back into hockey. Um, and what brought you back to the game? Well, when I, when I first came back. It was a matter of putting food on the table. Yeah. You know, we had the two young girls growing up and going to school, and uh, Holly was able to go to work, and I, you know, did what I could. I, I actually had a good job in retail sales with Kraft Canada, mm -hmm. um, 
And then all of a sudden, I got a call from uh, two former teammates in Gordy Clark and Mike Milbury. Um, they were looking for a scout for Ontario. Yeah. And uh, my, my answer basically was, when do I start? Yeah. Because it was something that I had always wanted to do, was to get back involved in hockey. And fortunately, I was able to. Like I got a comment on Mike Milbury. Did you see his picture of the CN Tower? And he called it the Space Needle? Oh. No, I, ha I haven't seen well, that. Well, he tweeted that out. I don't know how close you are with him now, but yeah, uh, yeah. I think it was last week because they're in the bubble for COVID. So he right. took the picture for the COVID bubble. He took a picture of the CN Tower and he said, it's so nice to be here by the Space Needle, something like that. I'm paraphrasing, but he, yes. got, he got lit on fire a little bit on, online. That sounds like Mike. Yes. <laughs> he, he, he doesn't matter what he comes out with, he'll cause some problems yeah, somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> so when you start scouting, um, what do you have to learn? Well, basically, you have to learn how to evaluate players. Mm -hmm. You know, um, when I first started with the New York Islanders, um, I was on the amateur side, so I was scouting the OHL, the Peets, and, and that sort of thing. I was one of our crossover scouts, so I had to scout all three major junior leagues in, in Canada, and plus I would go over to Europe for all the tournaments they would have. Mm -hmm. So, but. The, the biggest thing is you have to try to project a player. Um, you see how he plays right now, but you have to project in five years, what's he going to be? Yeah. Is he going to be able to play at that level in the NHL? What do you look for? Well, skating yeah. and size. You know, um, there's always room for that good, skilled, small player, but it's a lot easier for a big, strong guy that can skate to play. Yes. Yes. You know, so so that that that's what we would look like or look at to to play. Um, we had all our different categories to to try to evaluate the players, and we would have some very lively discussions amongst all the scouts. Mm -hmm. You know, because if if you really come out strong about a player, you knew that someone was going to come back at you and tell them that they saw a game where he wasn't very good. Yeah. You know, but uh, it it's one of those it's one of those things that. Like every job, you eventually learn and you're much more comfortable as the time goes on. Mm -hmm. And you eventually took that to uh, pro scouting with, with the Montreal Canadiens. And I'm just going to uh, draw a line here, but Bob Ganey also grew up in East City. Um, I'm assuming you guys know each other quite well. But uh, did that play a factor there? Without a doubt. Yeah. It, it, it was all who I knew. Yep. Uh, Bob Ganey and I grew up. Um, he was on the other side of the tracks going to Immaculate Conception. I went to Mark Street, but we played ball, hockey every day mm -hmm. in East City growing up. Um, as it turned out, Bob and I, we played on all the all-star teams growing up, and then we were able to play for the Peets. Uh, he was, of course, drafted to Montreal yeah. and became one of the best players ever. Um, but we've always stayed close, and when when the New York Islanders decided they didn't need a full-time scouting staff again, um, we had permission to send out our resumes. And, yeah. and I sent them out to everybody I knew. And of course, one of the first guys I sent it out to was Bob. And at the time, Andre Savard was their pro scout. And he had just left scouting to go back to coach in Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. um, so Bob called and said, uh, we don't have anything on the amateur side, but we have an opening on pro scouting. Would you be interested? And I said, yes, Bob, I would. The meals are probably a little bit better pro scouting. Yeah, yes, they, yes, they are. <laughs> <laughs> the meals and the travel, believe yes. it or not. <laughs> yeah, no more small rinks and cold winter days. You could end, find yourself in Florida in January or something like that. That was called creative scheduling. Yes. <laughs> So anybody in Florida, or anybody playing for Florida, better have a good uh, good January, is what you're saying. When that's all the scouts are down there, that's exactly it, <laughs> and, and a good schedule. So, b believe it or not, there would be times when you could schedule to go to Florida and just go back and forth from yeah. Fort Lauderdale to Tampa because teams would come in and play both teams on their on their yeah, southern yeah. swing. So it was uh, it was very advantageous. Yeah, hey. now people. Scouting is not easy. Like uh, people look at it and say, "Look at all these guys in black coats watching the game up there. Just what are they doing?" <laughs> um, everybody's seen them in a hockey arena, an OHL game. It's almost like there's a dress code, right? The black pea coats and the clipboard, and everybody's up there. But uh, how much focus does it really take during a game? And uh, how much did you take from 
that even your, your childhood learning the game and apply to scouting at the top level, which is the NHL? Well, you know, it was, it was interesting um, because I had um, had my opportunity to play in the NHL and to play in the American League, I, I would draw on what I remembered from that level mm -hmm. and watching these players just to see if I thought they could play at that level. So um, I think it was an advantage for me um, to be able to do that, but the bottom line comes down um, when, when you put your name on the line behind one of these players, you, you want to make sure that uh, he's going to be able to play. Can you think of your big wins, scouting? Well, I can tell you one of my big losses. Okay. And back when Corey Perry, who grew up here in Peterborough playing yeah. minor hockey, was playing, um, I had him high on my list. And we went out to the prospects game, and Corey didn't have a very good game. Um, and then come our draft meetings, I still had Corey on my list because I knew him growing up. Yep. I knew his character. I knew the type of kid he was. He was just a competitive, winning player. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had a few scouts on our line, on, in our team there, and, and they they just said, Doug, he was so poor at the prospects game. You know, we can't we can't have him that high on our list. I said that's fine, but I'm telling you right now. This is the guy we should be taking. Yeah, you know, so that that's one that I'm upset that we missed out on, but it, it's another learning experience. You just have to make sure that everybody knows that's the guy you wanted. Yeah, and but no, we, we had some 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 good players. Um, uh, Johnny Boychuk was one of the guys for the Islanders. He's still playing. Um, the, the, I can't think of the names right now, but there there were a number. Of, of players that, and it was more of a team effort because yeah. we would have all the reports from all the scouts and, you know, if there was any red flags, we would have to explore that and then, you know, come up with our list and, and see who we get. Well, like a guy like Carey Price being taken as high as he was, that must have been a debate. Number five, without a doubt, yeah. without a doubt. It, it was one of those ones, but um, goaltending is so important. Yeah, and yeah. it used to be the theory that you would wait till the second or third round to take a goaltender, but when you get a good one like Carey Price, you've got to step up and take him. Well, the theory seems to bounce all over the place. Oh yes. yeah, yeah. Well, it, it, it's interesting how it goes, but um, I have to give credit to the Boston Bruins scouts mm -hmm. um, because I can remember back when Patrice Bergeron, the year he was going, every time you went to a game, he always had the puck. But yeah. he, he, he wasn't a real strong skater. He's a second round pick, right? Second round yeah. pick. And they, they stepped up to take him in mm -hmm. the second round. And then the next year it was David Krejci. Same type player. Yeah. And now they're both playing. You know? And I mean, if, if you're one of the scouts from Boston who picked these two guys, you had a pretty good career. Yeah. <laughs> a pat on the back to yourself for That's those right. ones. Yes. Now, when you, when you do, I know you haven't been scouting since, since 2016, but does it change the way you watch a hockey game forever? It does. Yeah. It does. I mean, I just sit back and relax and enjoy the game. Okay. You know? so, you, so you can turn it off. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. I mean, I, I still stay in contact with some guys that are still scouting, mm -hmm. and they'll ask every now and again. And, you know, if, if I watch a game and I see a guy that's playing well or just doing things that I think are going to make him a player, I will tell some of the guys. Yeah. Say, you know, this guy looks like a player. You know, same thing when I come down to the Pete's games. Yeah. You know, you look and you watch. And, I mean, an easy guy is young Robertson. Yeah. I mean, he looks like a player that can play anywhere in your lineup. And he has the ability to score goals. Mm -hmm. You know, so, I mean, it's easy to pick out the good ones, but it's the guys later in the draft that all of a sudden play that's what makes a good scout. Yeah, that's, and I've heard that before. It's any, well, I think it was Jeff Tui who actually told me, any, any idiot can pick out a, a good player. That's right. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> but then what, so you talk about skating, you talk about size, and then underlying things that you can find outside the game, character, uh, grades, what their parents are like. Uh. Well, the, the interesting part, um, we used to go to games and we would always try to find out whose parents were at the game to see yeah. how big the dad was. Yes. Then, then you might be able to see how big this 
player might get to oh, be. That Semin Durgachinsev on the Pete's, you know, Mike Oak told me his or he has size 12 feet, so they anticipated he'd grow. <laughs> that's but that's yeah. exactly it. And the interesting part, character is big. Yeah. You know, when you're scouting, and if you have the opportunity um, to ever talk to the trainer of a team, yeah, that's where you get good information because they deal with the kids every day. Yeah. And they can tell you. If he's in a good mood when he comes to the rink, does he want to come to the rink every day? You know, all of those little things that all add up into your scouting evaluation. Yeah, I've seen uh, Brian Miller order the players around actually as a fa with the Peterborough Pete. So yeah, you're, he's. Oh yes. Yeah. 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 It, it, it's very interesting how 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 close they all become, mm -hmm. and and the players listen to the trainer and vice versa. Yeah. You know, so you, you get to learn a lot of the ins and outs. Now. We're, we're approaching the end of this, this interview here, but if you can reflect and look back on what were your, like you've had so many experiences, so many moments in different types in, in your, your uh, fast pitch days in town, uh, playing in the off season. We didn't talk about that actually, but we talked about it beforehand. Uh, so your contract didn't allow you to play other sports, but you still played uh, fast pitch in, in Peterborough. And just explain to me why, it was just you wanted to? I was playing with all my buddies. Yeah, we grew up together. We we played together, and um, it was a way for me to stay in shape. And but I would tell the guys before the game started. I said, "Okay, guys, I am not sliding." Yeah. So if if I'm on base, make sure you get a good hit so I can just trot home. Did they give you a hard time? Oh yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, when when push comes to shove, if the game's on the line and you have to slide, yes, you're going to slide. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it was good. I mean, I, I played and, you know, we, we would, uh, someone told us once that water skiing was good for your legs, so we, we lived out on the lake while I was yep. playing and, you know, we would, we would water ski every day. You're working out. You had yeah, to. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. We, we had to do that sort of thing. But, you know, it, it was good. I mean, it, it was one of those things you definitely thought about your contract, mm -hmm. but you had to stay in shape you know, that sort of thing. So, you know, I, I just continued to play and, and it was enjoyable playing with all my buddies. Yeah, well, I guess I think people lose sight of the fact that sports are a way to build your your actual abilities. Um, instead of just being in the gym all summer, you can go and cross train. Well, and, and I firmly believe that kids should play more than one sport. Mm -hmm. Growing up, we would play hockey in the winter and we'd be very upset when we lost out in the playoffs or, or whatever would happen. But then the next day we'd go home, put our hockey stuff away and get out our ball, glove and bat. Yeah. And, and, you know, over to the park to play. I mean, that, that's just the way it was growing up. We just went from sport to sport and, you know, we played every day. Now I've got a chance, I'm lucky enough to have experienced uh, winning in minor sports with my friends uh, and in school and all that, but I've never played professional sports, so I can't attest to this. So I'll ask you, uh, where does, like, as you look back now and reflect, you've won championships professionally, I'm assuming you won championships as an amateur with your friends. Do they feel almost the same? Does one outweigh the other? Uh, no. Mm -hmm. If you win, you win. And I have to tell you, with all the guys I grew up playing with at Mark Street in softball and hockey, our teams never lost a game, hockey or softball. Mm -hmm. We won the championship every year. And it, it's the sort of thing, we just expected it. Yeah. But we had a lot of good players, you know, that, that played, I think we played together every year. And it was the same guys playing softball that played hockey together, mm -hmm. you know. so. But for me, that's just the way it was. You know, we, we, had a good, we had good players, we had good coaches, and we won a lot of games. And as anyone can tell you, it's a lot more fun when you win than when you lose. Yeah, I don't think there's any greater bonding experience than winning with your friends. That's exactly it, yeah. exactly, yeah. No, it was, it was a lot of fun. What do you want your, sports, your lasting sports legacy to be uh, to your family, to the people of Peterborough and people internationally? What do you want uh, people to think of when they hear your name? Well, I, I just want them to think of a quality person who after his playing days was able to give back and coach minor sports as well. Mm -hmm. um, I, w I was able to come back home here and coach my two daughters in um, uh, church league softball. They grew up 
you know, yep. playing over at Mark Street. Um, just two years ago, I was able to coach my grandson, Daniel, playing. He was playing down in Clarington in the House League down the division yep. down there. And it all when I first got home, I was involved with the Peterborough Minor Hockey Council, and I was able to coach at the AAA level with a guy like Paul Crowley and, and Dave Kayser, uh, Billy Plager, mm -hmm. you know. We, we coached a lot of good players coming up and, and good teams. And, you know, I, I just feel, you know, maybe people can think, well, Doug was able to give back as well. And you continue to do so uh, with the golf tournaments uh, and the Hall of Fame. Yes, yes. Yeah. It, it's, it's, a, it's a labor of love, you know, helping to run the, you know, Jack's Peterborough District Sports Hall of Fame golf tournament every year. Yeah. It's, it's a great honor for the people that are inducted into our local hall Sports Hall of Fame, and it, it's well worth our time and effort. Now, I'll ask you one thing. It's, it's sort of topical, um, but in Oshawa right now, the Oshawa Sports Hall of Fame, uh, I don't know if you've heard, but uh, I guess the owner of the Generals is trying to get them out of the building. H how important do you, do you believe it is to have, in Peterborough, the, obviously the PMC holds the, the Hall of Fame. How important do you believe it is to have the Hall of Fame in the arena just like it is in Oshawa? Oh, I, I think it's very important. And... Oshawa basically copied our sports hall of fame mm -hmm. by by having it in their rink. Yeah, you know it, it's unfortunate that this owner of the Oshawa Generals is trying this power play. Yeah, you know to get more space, but I think it's very important. I, I mean, it's the legacy of sport in in Peterborough and in Oshawa. Uh, I I think that they have to they have to honor that, and yeah. and that's what it's all about. There has to be a way to make it work for both both sides. Yeah, I'm sure they'll figure it out, but uh, yeah. Yeah, the it Hall of Fames are interesting places. Th they really are, and, and as I tell people when I talk to them, I defy you to go through the Peterborough District Sports Hall of Fame and not come across a family member or someone you grew up with who are in the Hall of Fame. They might be just a team member of a team pitcher that's, that's yeah. up in the, in the Hall, but it represents so many people uh, of, of our Peterborough area. Even that, you take it one further, somebody who's not from Peterborough, somebody you played against, they can go another level. That's exactly yeah. it, exactly. And, and the work that the guys down at the Hall of Fame have put in, I can remember when we had the Memorial Cup here, I think it was 96, mm -hmm. they went in and all of a sudden they had all the sweaters from every team in, in the OHL, in the Quebec League, in the Western League, on display. I yeah. mean, it was fantastic, the, the way they helped represent our city. Huh. Absolutely. Well, Doug, thank you so much for your time. It was a pleasure talking to you. My pleasure. Thank you.